Welcome to the uh, GOBT Historical Society Museum. My name is Terry Gosselkin. and I'm the Executive Director of the Historical Society. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm um, so excited about tonight's event. I'm just going to talk uh, for a minute uh, because uh, we have a big panel and we have a lot to talk about. Um, I think we're going to go about an hour and a half or so. Um, and you know, this is an amazing occasion uh, this this whole week has been really emotional for me. Uh, about the, the anniversary, the 40th anniversary of uh, of uh, the assassinations of George Montgomery and Harvey Milk, of course, um, uh, on the heels of uh, the Jonestown massacre, and just thinking about all that. All of that happened right as I was getting out of high school, um, and uh, so you can do the math to figure out how old I am, and I am really proud to be as old as I am, uh, because so many have been lost to AIDS, and uh, of course uh, we have World AIDS Day coming up this week as well. Um, and uh, I was just doing a Salesforce uh, panel uh, up on the, I got to go to the top floor of the, uh, the, uh, the butt plug. It's the butt plug. The butt plug, yeah. yeah. So I went to the very top of the butt plug, which is not my first time <laughs> doing that, but uh, on this particular <laughs> I uh, Terry, 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 Terry. Calm it down. But uh, an amazing view up there, but I was talking to all their, you know, their peers resource group about, about AIDS and um, you know and I guess there's just so much pent up emotion this week I really got uh, overwhelmed uh, by the enormity of the loss but really about just particular people you know how particular people pop into your mind uh, just out of nowhere and some particular thing that they did and that's kind of where it hits you right there in the solar plexus I think and so tonight we're here in part to remember um, but also to talk about the legacies and about the, the current political situation and how that is informed by the legacy of Harvey Milk and of George Moscone. <laughs> is a drag queen, business owner, and activist who first gained international attention as a cast member on season five of RuPaul's Drag Race. Named San Francisco's best drag queen and cabaret performer by both Bay Area Reporter and SF Weekly, Honey's more recent work fuses art with the political. She's a founder and executive director of the Compton's Transgender Cultural District. I just want to give a LGBTQ Democratic Club, <laughs> a sitting member of the San Francisco Democratic Central County Committee, better and better, a member of San Francisco's Trans Advisory Committee, and an owner at the, do you have a life outside? <laughs> and an owner at the Stud, San Francisco's oldest LGBT bar. Honey currently hosts a weekly RuPaul drag race viewing parties every Friday with gal pal Sister Roma at the Lookout. Thank you, and with that, I'll turn it over to Roma. I mean, <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Um, thank you for coming. I uh, feel like God, I hate that, that that phrase now more than ever. But but really, I think that today, especially today, especially history is so important within the LGBT community, and specifically with those who are doing the work for the movement. Um, you know, as LGBT people, I think. We don't always grow up with um, LGBT role models within our own families, and so we really look to leadership um, and to community outside of our families to show us the way and to, to, set, set, an, to set an example. Um, and so I'm really pleased to be here with so many esteemed leaders within the movement, um, so many people who have really done the work before me and who have shown me um, what true leadership looks like. Um, I would. Oh, I'm hoping that we can just go down the line, maybe starting with Ken Jones, and do a brief round of intros so that everybody can know all the amazing things that we have all done. I'm almost uh, 80, so, you know. Tom, Tom, would you like to go first? No, no, it's okay. <laughs> 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 this is just an introduction? Just a, just a, yeah, introduction. I'm Ken Jones. Nice to meet you all. If you saw the... ABC TV series, When We Rise, my life story was one of those as well as Cleve's. 
Uh, I've been doing this work for a very long time and very excited about being with you tonight to share my perspective of kind of what I've been through the last 40 years. Uh, good evening, buenas noches. My name is Pablo Espinosa and I'm the co-executive director of PUA, Community United Against Violence. They'll be celebrating 40 years next year. Of that we are uh, sitting and standing on uh, Ohlone indigenous land. Thank you. Um, good evening, buenas noches. My name is Ani Rivera. I'm the executive director of Galeria de la Raza. Galeria is a 49-year-old organization that has um, was founded in the Mission District to create a space that was reflective of the Chicano Latino experience and we, um, do an array of exhibitions and public programs. Um, and I also work in my local neighborhood with the Mission Bernal Merchants Association, and we do a lot of beautification projects along the Mission Bernal area. Most recently, we took over the billboard that was being attacked by the protesters of Planned Parenthood, and we've been securing that for the last two years, which I'm really happy about. That's what I do on the side. And I'm gonna just, Close with originally, I'm not from the Bay Area. I'm originally from the borderlands, Tijuana, San Diego. Um, I've been here for 20 years, but I do call Tijuana, San Diego my home, my, my spirit, my family's all there. And it is because of that experience that has led me to the work that I'm doing now. So I want to acknowledge that too. Hi, my name is Brad Chapin. Uh, excuse me. I'm on the, the uh, board of the Harvey Milk Democratic Club, very proud of that with the amazing Honey Mahogany. Um, and I, uh, my background is in clinical psychology. Um, I studied uh, and still kind of study um, the ways in which social determinants affect mental health rather than seeing folks as mentally ill and sort of seeing them in their, um, without, a, without a larger context. I studied oppression and how that influenced mental health and how um, understanding social factors um, is really a necessary and key part of treatment. Um, but right now, my most, the most important thing I've done, I'm doing, that's fine, <laughs> um, is I take care of Harry Britt, who is, um, Harry basically created the Harvey Milk Democratic Club, which was once the, the San Francisco Gay Democratic Club and really built um, the Harvey Milk Club into an organizing force that I think will never go away. Um, just a really, really powerful man. Um, and I'm really proud to be in his life and to spread the word about him because I think he's a really under-recognized but also incredibly important figure in queer history. So thank you. Uh, I'm Don Romsberg. I'm the token historian on the panel, I guess, so I didn't uh, live through it, so I, I study it, right? Um, uh, I, I, I teach up at Sonoma State in Women's and Gender Studies. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the museum here, um, and I'm, I've been really involved in making sure that California's K-12 history education includes not just people like Harvey Milk, but Two-Spirit People, Bayard Rustin, um, uh, different kinds of lesbian movement stuff in the progressive era and many, many other things. So uh, that's, I guess, why I'm here. I'm Cleve Jones. I hitchhiked up from Phoenix in 72. I've been here off and on since then. I co-founded the uh, AIDS Foundation, Start the Quilt, and I was a student intern in Harvey's office uh, when he was killed. So I I knew all three of them. I knew Harvey, and I knew George, and I knew Dan. And Harvey used to tell me to wear my tightest jeans because it made Dan and Diane nervous. <laughs> True. He had no package if he get my drift up. Well, first, I'm so proud of all of us, and I, um, I just love the idea of a museum. And uh, we really do need big endowments in, in more than one way. You know, I, I, I went to Germany once for the 100th year anniversary of 
uh, the LGBT movement there, you know, Magnus Hirschfeld. And the, the thing that struck me the most was I said, who's paying for all this? And it was the government, the Academy de Kunst. And I said, well, that's, you know, I'm so, I want that for us. And we'll, we will get there. Um, they said to me, well, I said, this is so fabulous that you can, you know, so that the government can support all this. And they said, yes, but uh, this was in the 80s. But yes, but we don't right now have a openly gay elected anywhere like you do. And I said, well, you might be lucky. No, I didn't. <laughs> Oh, wait, I, I thought I would focus on two things that might be a little different tonight because we I know we have a big panel. It, one about gays and teachers and Harvey and, and how he was different from the rest. And then uh, I, I always think some, sometimes you might be interested in, in the comedy world and what the homophobia is there and, and how we had a different struggle there. So I think maybe that's what I'll uh, try to do in the time that's allotted. So thank you for having us. I just want to acknowledge that that was probably the quickest round of introductions I've ever seen here at the GLBT Historical Society. Um, so thank you to all our panelists. Um, I want to jump right into this talk about legacy and specifically Harvey Milk's legacy and invite anyone who wants to speak on it to maybe name what they see as the most important piece of Harvey's legacy, if you had to pick one. Uh, that he was out. Out was the revolutionary act getting out of the closet. Um, maybe today it doesn't seem as important, um, but it is, it still is. If you look at the sports world or when people come out, they're not necessarily treated well. And it was, it was the courage and the chutzpah. He did for a lot of us what we wanted to do for ourselves. So I would say being out and, and continuing the, um, the trajectory of how important that was specifically at that time. Yeah. I agree with that, absolutely. Um, Harvey you know, was constantly telling us that the single most important political act we could take was to come out and reveal our true nature to our family, our friends, our congregations, our colleagues, our co-workers. And, and then to add on to that, that it was not just our struggle and he saw us as connected to the broader global struggles against racism and war and poverty, and he wanted us to be a part of that, which differentiated him from so many of the other uh, gay political leaders of that time and those who have followed. Uh, he was never, ever a single-issue candidate. He was talking about gentrification and displacement in the mission in the 1970s. Uh, I work today in the labor movement, and that was, that's really a direct line from Harvey Milk and his involvement with the Teamsters and the Coors Beer Boycott of the mid-1970s and the uh, Briggs Initiative Prop 6, which brought us very close to the Teachers Union that was, were not initially uh, as welcoming as, as they should have been to, yeah. the, to the people we now call LGBTQ. So I think, uh, you know, Harvey talked about coming out. He, he, I don't know that we use the words diversity and inclusion as much as we do now, but lately I've been trying to make the point that diversity and inclusion are not in and of themselves the end goal. They are a mechanism that may help us get to the end goal, but the end goal is justice and peace and saving the planet and saving our democracy. And this city is, I think, an extraordinary example of how one can have all the diversity and inclusion one could imagine in, in our government and still be ruled by the oligarchs. Yeah. Just to build on that, um, before we had the word intersectionality, I think that something that, uh, that Harvey did, and sometimes very imperfectly, to be honest, um, uh, was to think about how to uh, build coalitions um, and how to uh, imagine a kind of um, collective space of solidarity-based action. Uh, and I say imperfectly because I know some in the women's community at the time really distrusted him. Um, uh, uh, I know that uh, there were ways in which sometimes he said things that certainly to today's ears would sound racist uh, in terms of the kinds of uh, nicknames that he gave people that he was close to, for example. Um, but he, he followed up uh, the ways in which he um, 
he acted as a politician, as a political candidate, and then as an activist, and then as a politician, with this commitment to a really solidarity-based vision. I was so struck by, I'd forgotten when I was kind of preparing for this, I, I'd forgotten about uh, one of his early acts on the Board of Supervisors being to encourage um, uh, the San Francisco city government to divest from uh, South Africa and uh, from apartheid South Africa. So uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, he was always, um, if imperfectly, um, engaging in this kind of intersectional analysis in his politics. Yeah, I guess sort of along those lines, I think um, one of the things that Harvey did was um, sort of fail in campaigns quite a bit in the beginning, but also create a direct pathway to uh, politics for activists. Um, and I think he really understood the politics of alienation, um, which was followed up by Harry. Um, and it was connected to labor and people of, across all the sorts of differences um, sort of uniting together um, and, and really creating grassroots political power um, in San Francisco that I think had much affects the sort of extended much, much further than um, San Francisco. Well, I wasn't around to meet him. I was around when he passed, but I think what I've known of who he was and the persona and who he was as a politician and how he operated, I think you can tell there was this, an, an artist spirit in him. The fact that there was um, an appreciation for photography, for documentation, for documenting our, our stories. I think that as a political um, figure, that's very unique to have that sensibility. We know that, you know, um, first it's art. Artists make a perfect world out of an imperfect, you know, a perfect world out of an imperfect situation. So I think that his sensibility around that and understanding that really allowed for a different point of entry and for folks that were looking to see themselves reflected a, a home, a place for home. That's what our cultural institutions and anchors do. And so I think that's really important, something that we have to take from that legacy. And as a person who's running an arts organization, we always try to do that. And, and to have somebody in history that did that boldly is really important. Um, because as living in this political climate, that's also the, one of the most radical things you can do is be an artist to express what an ideal world looks like and to create those spaces for others to plug into, so. I mean, part of his legacy is organizations like Co-op, Community United Against Violence, organization that drew me as, uh, in 1997, having just moved here to be, uh, trained to be a volunteer at the Speakers Bureau, um, which was the first program that Co-op had. And uh, the Speakers Bureau came out of, you know, that, that feeling of activism and being activated to do something, um, not just be against something, but actually be for something, support something, and supporting your community. And again, going back to, you know, original point of, that Tom said about being out. Um, and versus being outed and shamed um, when you don't have a choice, as, as you know, with the Briggs Initiative and, and the, uh, the uh, display over there in the other room, uh, co op created that speaker's bureau to train gay and lesbian and eventually bisexual and transgender people to speak in the schools about what it is to be us um, and about you know, our human rights, civil rights, uh, the visibility and the, and the power of community to young people. Um, and that in itself was a very controversial thing. And not everyone wanted that for the public schools. Um, and there was pushback and um, there was a history of uh, communities trying to sabotage that. But I think that was, you know, one of the most important things that, that Harvey Milk gave us was that um, self-determination to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And I think that's something that our organization has established over the 40 years has been community, has been you come in and you are part of this community. Um, you are take, determining your ability to heal from violence um, and taking that into your own hands, but doing it in, in you know, the loving circle of community. Um, and not not being alone in that process. So. 
I'm most grateful, and I think the gift that he gave to all of us is the gift of hope, the hope that we can all be full participants in San Francisco life, hope, and opportunity. Hope, very important that he gave us that um, no matter what this looks like, there's the possibility that we can be full and complete when we work together. Thank you. I, um, wow, very, very inspiring. I, you know, we can't separate um, Harvey Milk from the amazing work that he did in creating, first of all, the Gay Democratic Club, right? Because at the time there was nobody um, willing to, well, the, the only gay democratic club that was around or queer democratic club that was around wasn't willing to endorse him as a candidate for supervisor and there were no um, openly elected um, LGBT individuals at the time. So that representation was very important and it wasn't just you know, having a voice or an advocate, but really having a seat at the table um, that really made a difference in the LGBT civil rights movement. So um, my question to the panel now is, you know, do we have that seat at the table? And what do you think is the most pressing issue facing the LGBT community now? But I think it was Shirley Chisholm who said, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a, bring a folding chair. So, yeah. So, uh, the thing about milk, and you know, it, it wasn't just him. Um, I, and I think what the legislators and elected confused, and I saw it in Sacramento, is this was a movement. A movement is quite different than legislation and resolutions and debates. This uh, the immigration right now is a very good example of um, what's been happening around uh, interpreting um, activism, and, and so. Like me, a little bit, Milk was informed by his activism. Not like me, he was informed about being Jewish, and that all informed his view of the world, which, of course, was not perfect. I wouldn't love him if he was perfect. I couldn't stand him if he was perfect. We all know queens who are perfect. This is not a leader of a movement to be perfect. Uh, he did take his lead from the community, and you reminded me of something, so I'm going to go there. So Hank Wilson, wonderful guy. Um, movie being made about him, um, and uh, I hope you all support that. So we heard that the Alice B. Toklas Club, uh, we are naming names here, aren't we? The Alice, the Alice B. Toklas Club was having an endorsement meeting for a supervisor. I think in those days it was citywide. And um, um, there was a, a, a straight candidate who had already been on the board Drives me crazy, um, senior moments, you know. I think his, I want to say his name was, I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> Mandel, was it Mandel? Not Mandel, Min, we already have her. <laughs> no, not Pelosi, not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah, so Hank and I, in the middle of the day, it's noontime, there was a gay bar, and some of you, will probably remember this, across the street from the North Point Theater, which is no longer there. And it was a very, very typical gay bar for the period. You know, I can't remember its name either, but it was probably the Gilded This or the Golden. You know, like we were trying to hide who we were. Please. <laughs> and it was noon time and bright out and dark inside and it had flock red wallpaper and people were having their cocktails at noon. So Hank and I sat there and we listened to the pitch of the, of the straight guy, whose name I can't remember. Uh, anyway, Mendelssohn. Hey! Happy Hanukkah, motherfucker! <laughs> so, <clears throat> and he was very nice, he was very benign, and you know, and he had his suit on and all this, and the queens are going, la, la, la. So then Harry came, uh, Harry, see why? Harvey came up, and you know, he was kind of schleppy, he had the ponytail tied back, I don't know, you know, some kind of outfit. Um, and you know what, he wasn't great in terms of how you do a presentation. You could tell that he was learning, but he had such charisma and uh, just addressed all the right issues. And you know, maybe because Hank and I had been teachers uh, and we recognized something. Uh, and uh, we were totally in a and totally in love. And of course, he didn't get the endorsement. Hello, hello, hello. You know. 
So, you know, when we decided to come out as gay teachers, and, you know, uh, Cleve responded this way, well, you know, uh, the, the unions, a lot of our liberal bastions still were very uptight, you know, and they always, oh, there's no such thing as gay teachers. And I said, well, show, show me a room, show me a room full of teachers and I'll show you a gay bar, you know. I think I'm wandering, you only wanted one. So, yeah, that's yeah. Right. So, right. Right. Yeah. Like, what's most important? What's uh, most important uh, is the drifting right? away from the left, what people, for lack of a better call, you know, the, the queer left has contributed so much to fucking San Francisco, and it's always totally undermined. And, or, or not given the credit, and it's not about a person, it's definitely not about a person. So, my, I, take the ass out of assimilation. I'm worried when I'm looking at some LGBT officials who then uh, our straight allies sometimes take the lead from, that they're, they're wandering away from that vision. Uh, I call it gay liberation. Um, it's true, there's gonna be gay Republicans, kill me now, I get all that. But I don't want that bought into, and uh, you know what? In the current state of affairs, I don't believe in bipartisanship. I think that's bullshit. I think you're selling out when you do that. And Milk had that vision that, you know, when Feinstein, who was very powerful in those days, when she won the presidency, it's all very nice. The protocol is that then everyone joins in and votes for that person, even though they didn't support her. Well, it was, it was very foretelling that Harry and Gordon, uh, Harvey and Gordon Marr and, and uh, Gordon Lau, Lau <laughs> get my Gordons mixed up. Uh, anyway, I'm wondering. Anyway, and Mendelssohn. Anyway, that, that, that was a significant move to say, no, we're not always gonna play by your rules. You don't set the narrative for us. And I think, there you go. And with, without him, the gay teachers wouldn't have had as much credence as he did. Okay. I'm gonna state the question just one more time so, for everyone. So it's, do we, that's okay. Do we have a seat at the table now, finally? And what is the most pressing issue facing the LGBT movement or community? Well, I'm very glad that you used that phrase because we've heard a number of things about that seat at the table and how, you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu and there's been, okay, so. Uh, recently, Harvey Milk's nephew, Stuart Milk, who has the Harvey Milk Foundation, uh, was quoted in the New York Times as supporting uh, President Trump's nomination of a man named Rick Grinnell to be ambassador to Germany. Rick Grinnell is a gay man. Uh, he's also an extreme right-wing white nationalist. Uh, and uh, Stuart uh, was really the only liberal Democrat uh, certainly the only one quoted in the New York Times piece, which was on the front page, by the way. Uh, and all of the Senate Democrats were united in opposing Mr. Grinnell's nomination because he is, in fact, an extreme right-wing white nationalist. Uh, and Stuart Milk said that it was important uh, that we support this nomination because this was President Trump uh, telling LGBTQ people uh, that we in fact have a seat at the table. Now that is not the table at which I wish to sit, nor do I believe Harvey would have wanted to sit there. Rather, I would like to smash that table into kindling to burn it all down. So this is, you know, this is something I, I find myself repeating over and over. Now that every corporation in the country has vice presidents for diversity and inclusion, that that is not sufficient. It's not sufficient. And so it is important to remember that downtown, the Chamber of Commerce, the establishment of the Democratic Party establishment, opposed Harvey in every single election, sometimes with good people, sometimes with not so good people. And it was not just about his identity as a homosexual that made his victory so important. The last campaign when he won, he defeated another white gay man named Rick Stokes, who was not an evil man, but was backed by the downtown and the Chamber of Commerce. So, uh, seat at the table? I don't know. And also, I don't want to sit at a table. I mean, maybe they expand the table and they, they uh, add, add a variety of, of complexions and, and, and body sizes and 
proclivities, but if there's still a million people starving outside, there's another reason I don't want to be at that table. Let's, let's break it down or make it a much bigger table. Yeah, I would say that uh, one thing that Harvey uh, felt and lived but couldn't have possibly uh, known and fully reckoned with was the way in which San Francisco was moving from uh, an industrial economy to a de-industrial, to a post-industrial post uh, tech-centered city, right? Um, he did feel the, um, the initial sort of waves of gentrification as they came to the Castro, right? He got kicked out of his camera shop uh, location because he couldn't afford to, to be there anymore and, um, and uh, struggled uh, with his own, um, affording his own rent, um, uh, even when he was a supervisor. So uh, I think that the problems that um, were occurring at a neighborhood level uh, at that time, uh, and as rapid as, as gentrification was happening at that time, uh, continued to sort of accelerate and then went on steroids in the 2000s and in the, in the 2010s, right? Um, have really um, uh, left this city in a place of profound economic and cultural and historical trauma and crisis um, that we need true progressive leadership and courage and vision to uh, fight our way out of. And if we don't um, think boldly and big about how to resolve this problem locally um, in a relationship to the way in which we need to respond to it national, regionally, nationally, and globally, um, we're not going to be able to be um, a just and powerful and progressive space uh, engine of change for the rest of the country and the rest of the world uh, for very much longer. And so um, I really think that that is um, the acute crisis that um, so many other parts of our, of our, of our pain right now um, are about. Well, I guess to go back a little bit, I think one of the things um, that I think of when I think of Harvey, and a lot of my understanding of Harvey, by the way, I did, obviously did not meet him. I was not alive um, when he was killed. Um, but I have lived with Harry and have heard him talk about him every day. <laughs> um, and everything that Harry cares about um, when it comes to Harvey, which is so important to me um, to share, is I'm, basically I'm sort of saying what Harry might say. Um, but <clears throat> I'm trying to. Um, I think, yeah, what you were saying about um, Harvey didn't know what was coming necessarily. I think a lot of what was going on um, at his time was we had a working class LGBT or gay community um, that really doesn't exist here so much anymore. Um, you know, those who might have been part of it are working way too much to be able to be working part-time and to be able to afford an apartment and be a full-time activist. Uh, so those queer people, the people who would identify as queer now, I think, um, are not as common in the city. And so people, I'm gonna name names, like Scott Wiener does not represent me. I don't identify with him. Um, but those types of people have had a seat at the table. Um, we've had gay people in elected office in San Francisco, I think, since Harvey Milk was elected with no um, interruption. But at the same time, the types of people who have been in those offices, I think, have shifted as being gay has been something that you could be and be a Republican and conservative and like, that doesn't make sense, but um, the, the types of people who are there are very different. Um, Alice B. Toklas, who on their website says that they're the first LGBT Democratic club in the city is not the first LGBT Democratic club in the city. The club, Harvey Milk, the gay Democratic club was started because it was explicitly a gay Democratic club. Alice refused to be open about that. Um, so it was a closeted one, perhaps, but not really. Um, and that's really, I think, there's, a, there's an absence of a lot of political leadership that like Tom and Harry and Harvey <coughs> was unapologetically queer. Um, that really pushed the envelope um, and could do so with the working class gay folks, I think, just really heavily backing them 
um, and being um, sort of involved with the offices, which I, we do have to an extent now, but I think we're, we have a lot more challenges um, and we're not really at the table in the same way as we were before. I don't necessarily think I want to be at that table. What table are we talking about? Um, I also echo your sort of vision around um, the historical trauma that we're facing. I think that's still happening day in and day out when our spaces, our homes are being, um, you know, we're being kicked out and displaced. I think we have to think more globally as a community, as a society. I think that we have to think outside of what's happening even just within our borders and think internationally. I mean, look what's happening at the border right now, this moment. We have an LGBT caravan that is literally cannibalizing each other because they're trying to survive. Mm -hmm. Survive. And I think that those are the things that we need to be thinking about when we talk about the legacy, what the future looks like, how we're, you know, think, you know, building leadership that can have a global perspective of what our human rights issues are, are you know, affecting us. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't want to sit at the table. I, I wanna. I think I wanna think more about um, really how we're gonna address this, the the issues around justice and equity, and I think we need to have that perspective um, be instilled in in the younger queer generations. And I think that with the other issue that I think it's gonna be facing us, and it's already facing us, it's these issues around the politics of respectability. As queer people, how are we supposed to survive and be our full selves if we're being oppressed by the powers that be and other sources and we're not really addressing that? And I think that that happens in very subtle ways that we're not challenging. You know, what does nightlife for queer folks look like? What is, um, you know, how do we create, continue to create those safe spaces and invest in them because that is how we survive. It is through our unique sort of whether it's, you know, spaces like the stud, whether it's comedy, whether it is, you know, the arts, it's really, really important. I'm going to always go back to the arts. And that is what fights for me, what, what we need to be investing if we're going to address these issues of politics and respectability, building movements. I think it really has to be um, that we create spaces for folks to challenge the norm. Right now is really important. And so I think that's really a really, when I see young folks come through our doors at Galeria de la Raza, and they're telling me it's the first time they've been in a, you know, people of color, queer space. It is so uplifting. It also breaks my heart because we know we're not doing enough. Sam, we live in a bubble and we have to get ourselves out of this bubble. We keep comparing it to how great we have it and how it was before, but the reality is right outside the Bay Area, just 45 minutes out of here, we, we are not living the same reality, and so I think it's important for us to think about that in terms of future generations of queer movements. What does that look like? And now I'm rambling, so I'll leave it in that. I also, you know, opted to uh, give back that seat because I think there, there has been moments where that chair has been very prominently displayed for queer and trans people to come and sit and be a part of, uh, you know, government or be a part of change, whatever that means in the city, uh, we, build, we should build our own table and, you know, bring our people, people that we have, you know, intersecting goals with and commonality um, and make our own table. Um, and that's something that Kua has tried to do at least for the last, you know, 10, 12 years. Um, is re-examining our commitments around what was important to queer and trans people. Um, and uh, in terms of what are the most important issues that we are facing as queer and trans people, um, and I think it's been mentioned several times in different ways, um, poverty, wealth and equity, um, white supremacy, um, the way in which we uh, as a country are refusing to see how people of color um, and queer and trans people are becoming more and more in numbers and are being more and more oppressed. Mm -hmm. And that is clearly evident with who's sitting, you know, at the White House over there um, and all the people that he's brought into his administration. Uh, therefore, we have to <coughs> find ways to build coalition with each other to resist 
Sure, but we also have to build what else is possible. What are we trying to what are we trying to create again versus what are we just against? Um, but yeah, um, poverty and wealth inequity, uh, as we know, many communities are experiencing that uh, reality uh, as their you know, as you said, I mean, communities who are immigrating to this country are trying to. Um, because despite all that we are experiencing right now politically, um, in other countries, people are experiencing a violence in different levels and in different extreme realities. And they're still seeing the United States as a beacon of hope. Um, queer and trans people are as well. So what are we offering people once they get here? Um, and what kind of a table are we inviting them to? The table discussion for me is very complicated. <laughs> But I think I will hit it when we get to the personal remarks. So I don't want to be redundant. I'll just pass the mic right now. Okay, so with this talk about a seat at the table and maybe even building a new Sorry, I should use the microphone since, since it's in my hand. Um, with this talk of build, you know, potentially building a table that we can all sit at, um, one of the uh, most tangible, I think, legacies of Harvey Milk is, of course, um, the club, which is now in his name, which is the Harvey Milk LGBTQ Democratic Club. What do we think that the current role of that Democratic Club is today? Um, how has that changed over time? And if you don't care to answer that question, maybe a favorite memory of the Harvey Milk LGBT Democratic Club. I'm gonna go ahead and begin my remarks as an Alice member who kind of thought we were the first Democratic Club. <laughs> I may be wrong. I did want to talk a little bit about the Harvey Milk legacy from my own perspective. And that is, I think for the most part, we were all joyous about this gay elected official. And uh, Harvey knew the tremendous discrimination and prejudice that confronted gays and lesbians, not only in the city of county of San Francisco, but all over the world. And under his urging, the Board of Supervisors passed a gay rights ordinance in 1978 that protected gays and lesbians from being fired from their jobs because of their sexual preference. The point I was anxious to make was that along that very same front and gaining steam and force, African Americans woke up to find that suddenly they were like leftover Thanksgiving turkey as many of their secure and powerful seats on commissions and boards in the city were being replaced with gays and lesbians with seemingly very little experience. A lot, in fact, most of the city workers at that time were African American, Irish American, Italian American, appointed by the Burton forces and Mayor Alioto. But the culture had shifted. And at the same time, the Redevelopment Commission had uh, rebuilt the Western Edition, where most African Americans in San Francisco owned their own homes. They were forced out to build the Fillmore Development Center. And the proponents of this gentrification, which included many liberals, as well as business and civic interests, across the country, believed that raising and replacing large swaths of economically depressed older neighborhoods with bigger new buildings would result in lower crime, economic growth, and a higher standard of living. Forcing blacks, for the most part, out of San Francisco, and of course those tensions are with us today. If I can be totally candid for a hot second or two, we've created this permanent underclass and given them no hope, no resources, no boots, no straps to pull up. Now, am I going to be bold enough to suggest tonight that the Harvey Milk Freedom Fighters, our San Francisco progressive movement, has a responsibility to ensure that we all cross the finish line together on our way toward human dignity and worth for all. 
Am I be so bold as to call the remembrance our responsibility in rebuilding those forgotten communities of our forgotten communities? A group of people trying to navigate the world without an ounce of hope. Can you imagine? Knowing that the shitty fucked up day you had today is the same one you will have tomorrow and the next day and the next day. My heart breaks to know that right here in liberal San Francisco, an African-American brother or a mother will bring her newborn child home into that environment with the absence of hope. That child's only crime is being born in the wrong zip code and into an environment of hopelessness. That child's future has already been determined, and their future is not bright. Am I going to be that bold tonight? I doubt it, but we'll talk about it more during the Q&A. But in that very same moment of understanding all across the country, LGBTQ folk were experiencing the most vile attacks of homophobia. And the freedom strugglers held on to the hope of Harvey Milk that hope will never be silent. But before I close, let me fast forward to this day where I'm delighted to serve as a hands-on honorary board member of the Friends of the Harvey Milk Plaza. We're committed to maintaining and improving the public space named in honor of our civil rights icon. We see it as a sacred ground for LGBTQ civil rights history and we want to reimagine and reinvigorate this public space into a fitting and lasting tribute to the plaza's history and namesake. So that Harvey Milk's legacy may continue to educate and inspire generations of visitors. The new plaza will call to visitors and inspire them to create change in their own lives and in their own communities. We want to build a place where hope will live forever. Hope must never be silent. Now we do have our opposition. Actually, you would think we were removing the dining table from the Last Supper. <laughs> but there are thousands of folks from all over the world who visit that Harvey Milk Plaza on a daily basis, and they look at what it is <coughs> And they claim, that's it? That's your tribute to Harvey Bernard Milk? You can't be serious. And so I say, no, this is not it, but it is a project in the works. We have a dream. And I want you all to come along with us, the dream to build a monument that the people will visit and have an awakened passion for their struggle for full participation in the San Francisco life, hope, and opportunity. Thanks. Thank you. I think, especially in the beginning, I feel, of course, the Milk Club has been extremely strategic. Um, and I think, you know, when it was the San Francisco Gay Democratic Club, it wasn't very big. And I know that, um, you know, when Harvey was killed, it was renamed after Harvey, and I also am under the understanding that a lot of people who slept with Harvey joined the club, <laughs> um, and that it became bigger for that reason. Uh, but I don't know. Um, but I think it was unapologetically um, pro-queer, anti-gentrification, and really, I guess, gay, um, and it did not do what previous clubs had done, which was to appeal to the best in the mayor or whatever, but to actively oppose the mayor and the establishment at the time. Harvey Milk hated liberals, literally hated liberals, could barely stand to go to an Alice B. Toklas meeting. He um, had to be dragged into those meetings um, sometimes. Um, to what at the time block the other gay candidate from getting an endorsement. Um, 
And I do really feel that we, we um, are a little more buddy-buddy sometimes with um, the established powers um, than I would like to see. Um, and I, I don't think that we create the sort of hard lines um, of like why we're against what we're against and why we're for what we're for. Um, but the, uh, another big piece of it is I think the Milk Club at, the, at that time that it was being created and for a long time was really a massive organizing force in the city. Um, and one of the things I'm really inspired by is um, our, the influx of Democratic Socialists of America and this really large group of people um, that is building again. Harry Britt, Harvey Milk's successor, was one of the founding members of Democratic Socialists of America. Um, and really, uh, so much of the gentrification that is pushing our communities out um, and the things that are really threatening our culture and everything, all the things that I think so many of us care about, um, those things are all connected. And so I think the, my favorite parts of being involved in the Milk Club would have to do with understanding um, the senior members and being able to have relationships with those folks, to know what has been done before and has worked, to know what hasn't worked in the past, and to, do, and to really do things um, that have never been done before. And I'm really excited about building the club um, and building our force and our sort of coalition politics again um, in, a, in a time where I think there is administration that is equally as hated in some ways as Anita Bryant was um, and the Briggs Initiative and stuff like that. So I think what Harry often tells me is when it, it's in those times where we feel the most hopeless and that things feel the darkest that really people are like, so fed up with the bullshit and get together and fight to actually create real change and know that they can do it. I'm not a member. Um, and I, I love the tagline about, I'm here to recruit you, and I've been told that over and over, and for some reason I'm still not a member. So I'm gonna share a story, but because it still holds a very special place for me as a queer woman of color um, in the work that I've, I've you know, been blessed to do and, and creating a space um, that my, this is a memory, so my, one of my first um, sort of interactions with the club was really when we were hit with the violent attack around the queer mural that happened um, in 2015. And honestly, it was a very, very dark time. Um, I remember being at the corner of 24th and Bryant with my colleagues that I work with, and it's all queer women, and literally sitting there in the dark because we were in shock that they would dare burn, um, try to burn our building because of an image that was about love. And really kind of coming to terms with the homophobia we were experiencing, that what we were, you know, um, navigating, and some of the first folks that showed up to support us were Harvey Milk members. Um, on that night, it was, again, we were sitting there and I'm like, literally the fire department's taking the report and we're just like, what just happened? What are we living, right? We couldn't, we were in shock. And here comes Tom Temprano out of nowhere with like a bag of waters, snacks. And I remember that bag was a black bag from a liquor store and it was filled just with like, care items mm. and that was so important I think when we were sitting there like literally fearful fear of our life for our lives when we were getting that death threats and um, and then just sort of how to rebuild it was like how do we rebuild this how do we keep going how do we find that hope and know that this that we're doing this and this is we're on the right track and then in comes in Stephen. <laughs> and literally sat with us until late into the night, like, well, helping us secure the billboard, the wall. And it was just so important to see a club go outside for me for the first time that, that I felt they were reaching beyond just like what they do in, in terms of organizing politically, but to actually say, no, we are here because this matters. We are, you know, this is us. Um, and so that, for me, that memory, 
it's very, it's such, it's so valuable and it's so important because in that dark, dark, darkness that we were in, the club came through. And it was, it was just like, the, it was the first time that I said, those are my people, like, I can, they see my humanity, and I think that was really, extremely important. Um, and I still don't know why I'm not a member. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I do, yeah, so we do, I do, we do host the club's meetings at our current space. And it's amazing. We come in on. We make sure there's always a Tuesday, even though we don't open on Tuesdays, because we think it's really important that we um, create space for all these conversations to happen and to organize queer folks. And we hope that you will continue to come with us in our relocation. We are moving from our historical um, site after 46 years. We're going to be um, operating temporarily out of 16th in Mission until they uh, build a permanent home, which I have to raise $6 million so that we can lease to purchase it, but it's gonna happen. It's gonna be a beautiful 7,500 square foot space, and we're gonna continue to do public art, so we hope to continue to count on the um, milk support, but that, that to me was so important at that time, and I just have to say thank you, because I don't, I don't think I've ever officially thanked the entire club. Um, I think individually and, and by support I have, but it was, it was just the light during a really dark time for us that we just, yeah, so thank you. Don't drop the mic. Uh, in terms of the club, yeah, you know, the genesis of it was very pure and it was built on that, uh, you know, predication of out. We were, that we have gay in our name. And that was very significant at the time because in, in the past, and some of it was, you know, I wouldn't judge it. If you go way back to the 1930s, et cetera, and so forth, the sir and some of the other, they kept any connotation, daughters of Belitas, they kept the, any connotation uh, of queer out of their title, you know, and I kind of get it, and it was a stepping stone. Uh, and again, not imperfect. So I thought that was the beauty of, of that club and that it also honored uh, continue to honor uh, milk. Um, uh, I mean, dying, being shot in office. I mean, how much more do you need? And you know, frankly, there was still a lot of equivocation about using the term gay. And so, so for that, and in terms of the club itself, <clears throat> you know, just continue being my hero, even when you fuck up, because of the inclusiveness. Um, Drag queens, transgender, let's just talk drag queens because you know there's, there is a difference. We're not welcome. And there was a movement from, I forget the guy's name, of course, not here, from the Sentinel newspaper that there should be, this is the gay guy, no drag in the Chuck Morris yet. No, uh, Diane Feinstein went to his deathbed. If you uh, no drag. We shouldn't be in drag in the gay parade because that shows we're not mainstream, that shows we're not the same. We ain't the same. And let's celebrate it, Jesus Christ. Um, but there was that mentality and, the, and the, club, the club embraced that. They said, fuck this, of course. It, it, you know. In fact, if I'm on stage and, and there's a drag, I, I want to stand with drag because of their importance. Anyway, you, you get what I'm saying. So I can just continue to do that. There's always areas, uh, and one of the things, of course, as I get older, is like seniors, uh, and and uh, you know I've heard some nasty things, um, uh, as well as supportive things. But you know, gee, old gay guys, they're they're all. This is from the young gay people. All gay guys, you know, we're 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 uh, you know bitter old queens, and we're predators and all that. You know, that fucking has to change, and there's a responsibility, of course, for the older generation on that. Um, uh, and the disabled. The disabled have me continually fucked up. Over the years, you know, they are there for a lot of lefty causes, but we're not there for them. You know, and it, 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 it reminds me of the homeless issue. There's always so much more. Um, secondly, um, Ken's, uh, I'm very supportive of Ken's pitch for the, for the plaza and how it has to be you know, something of substance and something we're proud of. Uh, which brings me to your remark about uh, Stuart Milk, as long as we're saying names. Uh, I don't think it honors Harvey Milk's fucking legacy 
to have a picture of him on a bottle of friggin' vodka oh, or a ripple. That sucks. That's, that's corruption. That's corruption. And so we, we need to be aware of that. One time, a hundred years ago, I was a teacher started to come out, and I actually, and it wasn't a friendly situation, I invited the superintendent of schools to a milk club meeting. And actually, he turned out to be a pretty decent fellow. Believe it or not, his name was Ali Odo. No relation <laughs> to the Meshuggah, nothing. No. He was from the Queens, he was a New Yorker. And, um, you know, it took a little bit of everything to try to get him to come. And he came and he was beat up. Um, you know, the questions were fiery and what about kids getting beat up and gay kids and would you do this and would you do that? And I thought he really had his act together. And I, I probably could have never done that except in the, the venue of, of the Milk Club, you know, uh, because it was pushing forward and uh, nobody was kissing this guy's ass by any means. But I did respect his response and all that. Then after that, um, he asked me, um, would I be interested in uh, doing some administrative training? You know, like, would I be interested in being a principal? And I said, you know, head queen, I like that. <laughs> principal, not so much. But anyway, that's a story because from that contentious meeting, there was a little portal that opened in terms of the school district, so that's my favorite. Harvey Milk uh, ran a boycott against Coors Beer, and <laughs> his nephew takes money from Stolen Tonight to put in Harvey's face on the bottles. I, I can't fucking stand it. Um, the Milk Club has had its ups and downs over the decades, and over the early years, I was usually a member of both Alice and Harvey. Uh, I haven't been a member of either of them for quite a while, um, I don't really think it's fair to say that the, uh, Alice was not identified as a gay club, and it's important to remember that at that time in history, uh, if you used words like gay or homosexual, newspapers would not print them. And there was also, the, the closety part was on the part of the candidates who would, who would might be afraid to list that on their campaign literature, that for sure was a reality. But the Alice <clears throat> Betopas Club was a gay club. Uh, it later became a club mostly of gay and lesbian real estate agents for a while. Uh, and the Milk Club itself has had ups and downs, and their leadership has sometimes been very very strong and sometimes less so. Um, both clubs were profoundly impacted by the pandemic, and people tend to forget how many different ways the loss of 20,000 gay men affected everything about our city. I mean, uh, the absence of black gay people in this town is not just displacement, though that's a huge part of it, but you know, thousands of our African-American brothers died in the, in the pandemic. Um, I think it's one of the things, that the club, some of the things clubs have always done well, been very good, I think, at building those coalitions with other racial and ethnic groups. I remember like you and, and Hank, I think, brought Jewel Johnson to yeah. the club, uh, who was an African-American candidate for Board of Education. Um, who was the Latino woman? Um, my memory is going, but the club has had a consistently good record of bringing in candidates from racial and ethnic communities. Uh, the early coalition with the Chinese community was very much, it came out of the Milk Club and uh, Harvey. I remember the first uh, mixers between the Chinese American Democratic Club and the Milk Club, hosted by uh, later Judge uh, Lillian Singh. These were important things. Um, and I just have to say that you, yesterday, uh, were so eloquent. And <laughs> there was this London Breed event at, at City Hall to, to mark the 40th anniversary. And all the electeds were up there, oh shit, um, including uh, you know, our state senator. And, uh, and uh, all these people that opposed Prop C and all the other, and all the candidates that the Milk Club endorsed, and yeah. Honey Mahogany got right up there and said, well, you know, we, did, we endorsed, endorsed this person and this person and this measure, yeah. and all of the electeds and appointeds were up there, and Raphael was looking a little smug about it all, but you just, it was beautiful, <laughs> and I was really proud of you and, and the club uh, through all its ups and downs. 
the Milk Club has remained the voice of progressive LGBTQ people. And they have made very few serious mistakes over the years. And that's something that's you know, pretty remarkable. So I'm always grateful to the Milk Club. And I think that you know, Harvey would be really proud that it still exists and still bears his name. The Harvey Milk Questionnaire. <laughs> the burden to every about. They always say, well, how do you identify in terms of orientation? And all of a sudden, all these fucking people say, oh, bisexual, because they had a little affair in college. And that, do you remember that? <laughs> Everybody's bisexual. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I just want to say, um, you know, Poor Alice B. Toklas got a little tar and feathered tonight. I think um, I do. I do want to say that they are now the Alice B. Toklas LGBT Democratic Club. And they, that's a good thing. And, they and yes, I was just gonna say we, you know, as 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 the Harvey Milk LGBTQ Democratic Club have actually worked incredibly well with Alice B. Toklas this last year. You know, we supported many of the same candidates for supervisor. We both supported props, many of the same propositions, and we also. Um, you know, both called out London Breed and Scott Weiner in their opposition to Prop C and also in their yeah. uh, in endorsement of Josephine Zhao. So um, I just want to recognize that, you know, we did get established a little bit in opposition to Alice B. Toklas, but, um, you know, both clubs have changed over time to an extent, and, um, and right, right now we're in a good place and we're working together, and I think that Alice B. Toklas also has some really excellent leadership um, going for them right now. Um, and for, for me personally, um, as co-president of the Harvey Milk Democratic Club, um, I want to say that what drew me to the club was really truly its diversity. I mean, I am I'm someone who has been involved in a lot of different LGBT organizations, um, you know, over the last I would, two decades, and um, I have often found myself being the only person of color in the room. Um, I have often found myself being the only gender non-conforming person in the room or the only drag queen in the room, you know, like all these different things. And when I, you know, walked into my first Milk Club meeting, I was just astounded that there were so, well, so many people of color and that there were so many women that were in the room with me. And that, to me, <coughs> was a good thing. And that, to me, made me feel welcome and safe. And like I could have, um, uh, I, that I could invest myself in the club. And I think that the fact that, the, and, I, and I, that's not by happenstance. I think that that is a very purposeful thing and a purposeful effort on, the, on, the, on behalf of the club. I think it's a, a part of the, the club's real um, mission is to uplift the leadership of people of color and the, and the most marginalized and women and highlight them and, and help train them and prepare them for um, a life in public office or even just a life in advocacy and, and, and leadership work within the community. Um, also, I think, um, and this, we still do differ from, I think, Alice B. Toklas in this way. I think the Milk Club is um, a little more, um, I don't want to, I want to say reactionary, but we're not afraid to say shit when it needs to be said. And we're not, a, we're not afraid to speak truth to power. We're not afraid to call out elected officials, even if, um, we know it's going to get us in a shit ton of trouble, even if, and even sometimes if we think that, you know, there may be some way to compromise with them, and I think that's an important role. I think there always needs to be someone that is willing to call people out there on their shit in a very public way, especially when it comes to elected officials, because that's the only way to get to them. I had a conversation with, um, Lon uh, oof, well, I already started saying it, London Breed, um, before she became mayor, and, um, you know, one of the things that, she, you know, she said to me was that she um, oftentimes felt very attacked by, um, you know, some of the more left-leaning, um, you know, politicians and clubs, and she thought that that was unfair. And, you know, I kind of had to explain to her, yeah, because that's what we do, you know. You, you're not going to get, she, and she was saying how she, she, did, she never gets... You know, the developers and all these other people never are, don't play as dirty as, you know, we do. And I, I effectively, I said, well, yeah, because they have money and they can fund your opponent. Like, all we have is our claws. 
And so that's what, those are the tools that we have and that's how we are gonna get your attention and that's how, we, because we can't necessarily, you know, fund your campaign, but we can, you know, take it to the streets. And so I think that is truly Harvey Milk LGBTQ Democratic Club's role is to be that, that activist, to be that voice and to really call things like it is and not be afraid.